And so, we will now commence and start, start the day with our very, very first uh, speaker workshop. And what a way it is to start off Saturday morning here at the Packet Hacking Village in the speaker workshop with a blockbuster, with a blockbuster uh, workshop. And this morning we have an old friend of ours, uh, and not only an old friend of ours, but also a supporter as well. Uh, she is here to present on uh, using machine learning, which is our speaker's passion, and uh, mobile malware. And it is my absolute honor and very big pleasure to present to you the Vice President of Mobile at Veracode, Theodore, Theodore Tatonis. Thank you so much, Ming. Really appreciate it. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you today. You know, I picked 10 a.m. on Saturday morning uh, because I think it weeds out everybody else. So first of all, I commend you for waking up and getting here and uh, being on time. A um, little bit about my background. You know, as Ming mentioned, my current title is uh, Vice President of Mobile at Veracode. Uh, but I came to them via an acquisition. So I was the founder and CEO of a company called Marvin Mobile Security. Uh, we launched Marvin at TechCrunch Disrupt in uh, September 2011, and were acquired by Veracode in September 2012. So uh, here we are. Uh, and and the, the basis of the technology of Veracode for the mobile application reputation service is largely based on what we did at Marvin uh, with the machine learning. But really quickly, you know, Ming said machine learning is my passion, and we've been working with folks at uh, UC Berkeley since 2008 looking at machine learning to detect malware. And my background is uh, defense and intelligence agency prior to Veracode, prior to Marvin. So what happened there was, uh, you know, some salesperson would go out, have a steak dinner, or take another sale, or take another vendor to go golfing, and you know, whatever. They come in, they lay a pile of crap on the table, and they'd say, "Make this work, right?" And it was, oh, excuse me, and it was. Uh, let me see. I'll put this in my pocket. Can you hear me okay still? Sorry about that. Um, so, you know, make it work. And there was nothing that we could ever do to make that pile of crap work. So we thought, you know, certainly there's a better way, right? So we started to look at these types of technologies. And what I wanted to do today is really get hands on to show you, you know, how easy it is to start with Python, with Scikit-Learn, with some of these technologies to start to classify uh, malware and feeding this data into these algorithms. So quick show of hands just so I can, you know, focus on the right things here today. Um, and who's interested in machine learning? Yes, yay. Uh, mobile in general? Very good, awesome. So let's jump right in. Uh, the agenda here, I, I am gonna really deep dive into number five, uh, the machine learning, and spend a lot of time there. Uh, but we're gonna talk in general about the mobile uh, risk you know, at, at Veracode, we uh, focus on um, protecting the enterprise, uh, where their employees are bringing in these applications on their devices. Uh, we'll look at the threats, the vulnerabilities, but I suspect a large majority of you are really familiar with those sort of things. So again, we're going to go through that quickly and dive into uh, the ML. So focusing on the applications, right, because that's where we see the greatest risk uh, are the applications for uh, sensitive data loss, you know, from the enterprise, from the consumer. And, and there's two statistics I like to point out on this uh, slide. One being that nearly 50% of the enterprises have already uh, experienced a breach uh, due to a mobile device accessing a network. And the other statistic is on the other side there, where 75% uh, of mobile breaches uh, will come via the apps as opposed to attacks on the devices, and that's uh, projected by Gartner through 2017. But as we think about mobile security, you know, think about the stacks, right? So security's hard, divide and conquer. So in the mobile security stack, uh, the applications are the topmost stack, reliant on, on the, all the underlying stacks, right? So at the bottom, we have the infrastructure layer, Verizon, AT&T, um, right? They're responsible for dealing with their security at that layer, right? 
making sure there's no DDoS for voice over IP, things like that. Uh, step it up a notch, we have the actual devices. So the infrastructure layer interfacing with the firmware on the devices, Samsung, LTE, um, Apple, uh, responsible for the device layer security. And then, you know, you take that up a notch to the operating system layer. So Google, Android, uh, Samsung, uh, you know, with all these versions of Android, uh, and iOS, uh, responsible for those, that layer of security. And then again, at the topmost layer, are the applications, and that's really what we're focused on. You know, it, I'll also stop to say, you know, it, I think it's my background in computer science, machine learning, big data, that really makes me want to become more scientific, more data-driven uh, with calculating that risk, right? So risk equals probability times impact. And, you know, you start to really start to break down. And I think mobile provides us with that good opportunity to break down and get more scientific in our risk assessment by looking at that probability of these apps making their way onto these devices and the impact of those actual apps. Like, what are they doing? You know, they're not just running on the device. They're connecting to servers located around the world. Uh, there's currently an iOS flashlight app uh, that connects to 180 different servers during our behavioral analysis. Like, why is it doing that? So um, vulnerabilities, it's Veracode's bread and butter. The top vulnerabilities that we see on iOS and Android for the apps that the enterprise is producing, right, they, we want to make sure that those apps are secure, free of vulnerabilities, are cryptographic issues. So this is no surprise, right? Crypto is hard on mobile. You know, think about where are you going to store the key, you know, on the device that could be rooted by another device? Well, you know, it, it roots the device and can get to the key and all bets are off, right? Okay, so then let's use OAuth, a token-based solution. Let's store the key on the server. Well, what about, you know, when the uh, mobile device can't connect to the server? You know, that app becomes useless. So it's really no surprise that uh, cryptographic issues are the top um, issues that we see. How many in here build mobile apps? Yay. Android and iOS. So you guys know, it's not easy. So, you know, and then again, we talk about cryptographic issues just protecting the data in use and transit and at rest. So, you know, at rest, making sure the SQLite database is encrypted, uh, but also, again, in transit, looking at these apps and connecting to these servers that aren't properly pinning their certificates, uh, et cetera. So it, it's not just an on-device issue when we talk about crypto. So what we like to promote at Veracode is the secure software development lifecycle, right? Not an afterthought, not, you know, getting in your way, um, when you're developing these mobile apps, really making it part of your routine, integrated with the IDEs, every new build, you know, run it through, do a static analysis, look for these vulnerabilities, uh, we'll provide you with remediation options, et cetera. So the top attacks that we see on iOS and Android are MRATs, Mobile uh, Remote Access Trojans, right? So that's uh, similar across the board. Uh, Man in the Middle, which I think is our next speaker talking about that, um, you know, big issue. Again, with those certificates not being properly pinned, with the data going back and forth, being able to man in, in the middle, uh, considerable number of applications, uh, wallet apps, um, with some gambling apps we can show you where they're storing the key in their code. Uh, so man in the middle is an issue. Um, let's see here, we have web quit vulnerabilities, zero day attacks on iOS. Oh, the, the certificates in the profiles. I think MobileIron uh, is coming out with some uh, interesting research on this, but you know, think about it. I could send a any of you on an iOS device a link that says, you know, open this, Spearfish, whatever, open this link on your um, mobile device, I I'll show you a cool app, right? So they open it on their mobile device, and all of a sudden, you know, they've installed a, a profile that allows me to proxy all their traffic uh, through, you know, my man-in-the-middle proxy to see all their data. So these profiles, these certificates are uh, an issue on iOS, and I see those as a real vulnerability. Profiles in particular uh, with the man in the middle. And then, you know, we, we all have probably become aware of uh, stage fright and some other uh, recent exploits on Android. I think that the issue with Android, you know, is not uh, that it's insecure because of the open source nature of the code or because it's not the walled garden that Apple 
uh, provides. But the issue with Android is Google doesn't have a way to um, update these devices in, in a timely, efficient way, right? They're reliant upon the carriers, they're reliant on the device manufacturers. So they have no way of getting these updates out there, right? All code has vulnerabilities and securities, all software has that. But it's the processes uh, as how we remediate those vulnerabilities that really matters. And I think Android and Google in particular are struggling with that uh, to push these updates out because they're reliant on the carriers. And I think that's why it makes it a more insecure um, operating system. So, you know, we're jumping into the uh, ML here. You know, mobile malware detection. Again, you know, why are we doing this? Why, why are we looking at new solutions? Well, uh, antivirus on mobile just will not work, right? You know, think of all the signatures. Think of all, you know, how your computer in the wired world just slows down, chug, 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 when the AV is running uh, through all those signatures to see if there's a match on your, uh, on your uh, computer. So we need new ways. You know, on mobile, there's limited CPU, limited memory, battery. Um, so AV isn't going to work. So, it, you know, even Symantec says uh, AV is dead. And then as we look at these malware samples, again, you know, more of an issue on the Android side. Um, but, but with iOS, you know, I talk, talked about the inherent issues with the profiles and the certificates, et cetera. But you can see here mobile malware uh, from 2011 to 2014 growing to, you know, about uh, 1.5 million malware samples. And then if we look at, you know, first quarter of uh, 2015, how those are growing as well. So really uh, looking at a threefold growth, I think, from uh, previous Q1 2014 to 2015. So why, you know, mobile malware? Well, uh, a lot of that is uh, financially motivated. And I think as we start to use these de devices more for uh, wallets, more for payment transactions, um, I mean, they're, they're tracking devices, right? So there's tons of information, tons of data uh, that can be monetized there, it, you know, as well as, you know, the real currency stuff with the, the wallets and, you know, banking credentials, et cetera. All right, so I got through that pretty quickly and I'm sure all you guys have seen a lot of that before and familiar with it, but this is really, again, where I'd like to spend the majority of our time, is using machine learning to detect mobile malware. So, you know, what we found initially in doing our research, and we used the Windows XP malware data set, right? This was way back in 2008, so, you know, we didn't have 1.5 million variants of Android malware that we're able to train on today. Uh, but we used XP because we thought, hey, if we can make it work there, we can make it work anywhere. And, and let me just step back and say, you know, as I talk about the operating systems for iOS and Android, like, thank goodness they're Unix-based operating systems that are sandboxed, right? Uh, the application, like, good Lord, if we had to deal with XP on mobile, like, that would be a disaster. Um, so when we looked at the XP malware, um, what we found in looking at you know, what vendors provided signatures for different variants of malware, it really aligned, right, with, you know, a vendor one was able to find a lot of Trojans but missed viruses and worms. You know, vendor two found a lot of viruses but missed the worms, you know, missed the Trojans, et cetera. So why does this happen? Well, two things. You know, the vendor becomes really good at, you know, what they're looking for, right? There's a human bias inherent in you know, what these uh, malware detection, you know, these tools, what they're familiar with. So you know, human beings aren't very good at getting out of their own biases and, and really expanding to see different things. So they're looking for what they know, and, and that's what they find. And their tools are around what they know, and there's some you know, expertise involved. And you know, on a whole, if you look at you know, kind of the whole vendor um, ecosystem, like it's great. Like, Great, everybody's finding different things and, and that works out. But it really doesn't scale uh, because there's not enough people like you all to, to go and be able to detect these things at scale. Uh, and then, you know, again, we have our human biases. So the correlation between type of malware detected and security vendor, um, you know, poses a uh, problem with this type of approach. Um, you know, the, the cognitive bias and the tools that they're using and what they're looking for and, uh, you know, that there's only a little bit that we can really look for. It really is a needle in a haystack. 
So, you know, what, this is going back to 1990, uh, but I think we've really started to see the research trends in using ML to detect malware really grow, again, 2007, 2008. Uh, to, you know, to today, uh, this only goes to 2011, but you know you can see the, the trend and how it's going. So you know any Google Scholar search on uh, machine learning to detect malware, uh, you'll see you know a, a lot more research in that realm. And I, I think you know as the machine learning tools become more readily available, um, now we're talking about deep learning. I don't know if you guys are all familiar with deep learning, uh, where we don't have to train. Right? So there's supervised and unsupervised learning, which we'll talk about, where we don't have to train the data, where we can find those correlations and find the, the malicious um, uh, binaries uh, without training it is also going to be very interesting moving forward. So this is uh, our patent on this. It was filed in uh, 2011. So automated behavioral and static analysis using an instrumented sandbox and machine learning classification for, mach for mobile security. So what we're doing here is we're doing static and dynamic behavioral analysis on these applications. And it's really important as you're doing this, right? We're talking about calculations, we're talking about statistics. It's really important to have a standard baseline. So on the Android side, uh, we're using emulators because we can really get the data that we need from the Android emulators and we can scale those in AWS, which is great. Um, but we know our baseline every time, so we know we're measuring CPU, we're measuring memory, threads, we're measuring you know, the files that are changed on those um, emulator devices. You know, we're also making it stealthy, right? We're making sure to have the, uh, you know, your number of bars for your carrier go up and down, your battery go up and down, et cetera, uh, because it, you know, still these malware variants are gonna say, emulator, don't do anything bad, right? Check first thing you write when you write a malicious variant. Um, but you, you, so you want to make it stealthy, and it's highly instrumented in detecting all these things. Uh, on iOS, we don't have an emulator that will give us uh, that level of data that we need, uh, so we have to actually perform the behavioral analysis on devices. But uh, Amazon just announced actually two days ago that AWS is now uh, providing actual devices in their cloud for testing, so we're looking into that uh, so that we can scale there as well. Static analysis, uh, we're looking for things like the vulnerabilities, the cryptographic vulnerabilities. We're looking for API interactions, right? So, you know, does this flashlight app access your microphone? You know, that, that would be something that would be a predictive feature and probably move it closer to the spyware category than the flashlight category of apps. So uh, I know this is really hard to see, but uh, our patent's been referenced 21 times by uh, folks like Amazon, uh, Trend Micro, FireEye, uh, Qualcomm, uh, Intuit, et cetera. So it's great to see that you know this approach is kind of taking off because I really think this is the future of uh, malware detection on mobile. So again, really bad slide here. I can't see anything, but if, if you were more interested, this uh, image is out there uh, looking at you know how the security domain um, and the machine learning domain kind of line up. Uh, wait, move past that quickly. And then, you know, this slide is just more talking about that process that we go through uh, using the static and the behavioral analysis, getting all that different types of data, right? So massive amounts of data after we do those static and dynamic analysis. One, you know, small app can produce a thousand pages of uh, data, so good luck you know, as a human being looking at that, looking for the needle in the haystack, trying to find, um, you know, what's malicious in this type of application. The only way to do it is to, you know, put all that data in to these machine learning algorithms. And again, we'll talk about how to visualize this, you know, how these machine learning algorithms work. Uh, you know, we've had some difficulty, honestly, in describing this uh, technology in a way that people can understand, right? It's kind of like, oh, you throw all this data into the machine learning black box and, you know, it's like magic. It comes out with a, you know, prediction of um, maliciousness. And they're like, ah, oh, explain that magic to us a little bit more. So, you know, we've had to get better at that. You know, there's some new visualizations out there that kind of help people wrap their head around what these really advanced algorithms are doing. Uh, but the way that you can think about it, and, and I think it's on my next slide, we'll start to 
look at you know what data goes in and then what you can visualize coming out. So features, you know, we talked about the measuring devices, we talked about the sensors, right? So that's the emulator, uh, that's the static analysis. Um, that's all creating features. And, and really, you know, you can have a million features basically uh, that go out, uh, but we've, you know, kind of found a sweet spot around 500 or so highly predictive features. So, you know, you're looking at those features, and, and it is a data scientist, I don't know if anybody's played around with uh, scikit-learn with Python looking at machine learning, I think you'll find that um, you spend a lot of time <laughs> trying to create what's called the design matrix, right, where you have your features as columns and your binaries as rows. It, so, you know, you get all that, you find your features, um, and then you perform your prediction. So in our case, it's binary classification, right, so we're, we're looking uh, and trying to predict um, malicious applications. And then um, you select a model, which quite frankly, I think a lot of people get caught up with this as well. And what model should I use? Should I use random forest? Uh, should I use um, support vector machines? You know, what should I use? You know what, there's uh, something called ensemble machine learning, which basically you throw it into all those and the algorithm decides what is best. So don't get caught up on the model selection at all. Just use an ensemble and let the uh, let that decide you know whether the random force provided a better prediction uh, than the support vector machines etc so this is kind of how I wanted you to visualize you know we talked about again the features as columns and the apps as rows so think of you know one column being network traffic right so uh, again a flashlight app, that is accessing 180 different servers. Like, why is it doing that? Uh, so that, that would be a feature, right? Um, another feature would be, uh, you know, trying to uh, root the device. So that's an API, a static uh, code capabilities feature. Um, network traffic, TCP, UDP. Uh, just, you know, again, any number of features. We found uh, for us 500 is a pretty good sweet spot where we can do these um, predictions in real time. And, and overfitting is an issue as well, uh, but again, you know, let these models, let the ensemble kind of take care of that for you. So, you know, on the left there is the uh, visualization of kind of how random forest works. You could think of it like a Plinko game, <laughs> where, you know, it's kind of taking those features and it's saying, okay, you go over here, you go over there, uh, but on a very, high dimensional space. And I think this is what kind of tricks people up when you start to talk about machine learning in the black box of things is, you know, we as human beings can think about three dimensions, maybe four. Uh, this little graphic in the middle, that's five dimensions. But try to think about 500. I don't know about you, but my brain explodes. Like, there's no way I can think about 500 dimensions at one time. So that's what these algorithms are capable of doing, is looking at these things, you know, across 500 different dimensions. So, you know, going back to that plot that we saw, you know, with kind of the mountains, and the, at the bottom, you know, there were the dots, you know, on the, that lower graph. We'll think about that in the way of using machine learning and support vector machines and um, classification. What will happen is, you know, the spyware apps will all cluster together, the adware apps will all cluster together because of these features, right? And again, across 500 different dimensions, but let's just try to think of it in three. Uh, spyware over here, adware over here, um, Trojans over here, and, and then you have, you know, so you get your flashlight app, a new app that somebody just, you know, uploaded to the app store. We go out, we perform the static and behavioral analysis. It takes us about three, 30 minutes or so to get all the data that we need. Do the, um, send it to the machine learning model that we've trained and, and then, you know, come back with a prediction. So 30 minutes or so that takes us. But once we get that, you know, again, in the machine learning black box, you can think of, okay, that flashlight app, whoa, it's way over here next to spyware. It's not, you know, with the rest of the flashlight apps. So that's what, you know, provides that probability of maliciousness, probability of, of spyware as opposed to probability of a benign flashlight app. Does that make sense? Oh, good. The nods. Awesome. 
So, you know, as we talk about this, how do we know that our model is good? How do we know that that, that spyware cluster is really spyware? And, and when you're talking about, you know, millions of apps, again, you know, a human can't go in and, and check all those things. So what we use is what's called area under the curve, AUC. You're familiar, some of the folks that are familiar with machine learning. So what AUC is essentially um, is the probability that a malicious app ranks higher, right? So probability, we're talking scale of zero to one. So a ma malicious app is closer to one than uh, our corpus of benign apps. So that's really all that AUC is, the probability that an app is malicious. And what we have to do, because we're talking about malicious and benign, right, there's a cutoff somewhere. What we have to do is find that cutoff in between um, wh where, you know, we, we find that sweet spot of uh, false positive versus false negative, right? And this is where kind of overfitting comes in. You know, we, we could get really accurate, and some of our models are very accurate, um, a 0.99 in AUC. Uh, so that the curve there, you want to get that curve closest to the 1.0 as you're determining uh, the effectiveness of your model using AUC. So, so we could get it to 0.99, um, but you know we have to find that uh, balance between false positive and false negative. Cross validation is also uh, very important, right? So you want to use cross validation. Uh, to uh, make sure when you take your testing and your training data set, uh, and again, so you're not overfitting. So I'm going to do a demonstration. And before I do that, I don't know, Mac users, hopefully. Good. Okay. Uh, so this is how you would set up your Mac environment. So uh, you can brew install, pip install. Um, really, you want Python and scikit-learn. But this is a good, uh, it kinda, you kind of have to go in these steps to get it working properly. Um, that, you know, there's some prepackaged uh, scikit-learn libraries that kind of do all this for you. But it, it is important to get these steps down. So what we're going to do is kind of go through, and this is a, make sure, yeah, this is a, really just a hello world, if you will, of uh, binary classification, logistic regression. So we're going to generate some data to train with. So this can all happen within sklearn, the, the data sets. Um, we're going to take a look at how large the data is and what the labels look like, so you'll see a plot that does that. Uh, the data is two-dimensional, so not, not too big, so we can easy, easily visualize it. Uh, we're we're going to see some dots where it's the red as malicious Android apps you can think of and the green as benign. Um, so look at this code here. You can see PyLab. Uh, we're doing the plots here. Um, importing logistic regression from scikit-learn uh, and generate a classification. Split the data set into training and testing. So think of that logically, right? The training labels, we know that these are no malware. Uh, we get a feed every night of 5,000 uh, new Android malware variants and, and put that into the algorithm. Uh, so those are labeled known malware that we can train on. Uh, and the unknown is what we get from employee devices and from um, the app stores as you new users, new developers add that. So training and testing is very important. And then we'll visualize the data again. Uh, labeling the training points and testing points as white triangles so you can kind of see where they are in that two-dimensional plot. And then we'll do logistic re regression, right? So again, when we do this, when we're actually doing our models, um, we're not testing on the training data. So that's pretty important to know, too. So it's like when we do these, this step here, it's as if they, it hadn't seen the app before. So testing on training data is really easy. You'll get a 1.0 AUC every time because you know that it's, uh, it's malicious. But keep in mind that at this step, it, that's not what we're doing. Uh, set the cl colors using the predicted class. And then we'll, we'll look at our AUC. So that's kind of the last step here. And again, you know, with some print lines, really, this is like 30 lines of code, I think, if you look back at my um, example. So let's just go ahead and run this. 
And OK, this is pretty simple. Um, you can see the red are the malicious, and the green are the uh, benign. So there's a pretty simple, um, we'll, do a, we'll run through this again and see if they kind of commingle a little bit. With the testing set, uh, it's pretty defined. And then you can see the triangles, as I mentioned. This is the training. Uh, so uh, that's there that we were looking for. And then there we go. So very easy logistic re regression finds uh, the, the, the line between malicious apps and the benign apps. And then we go back and um, our AUC is 1.0. So wow, aren't we great? Let's, let's try it again. Let me see if I can get something a little bit more. It's a little bit closer. You can see one more time. Like, eh. that's the problem with using the, uh, the generated training set. Yeah, OK. Let's see where it does the line. Yeah, you can see here, like, this one, is it malicious or is it benign, right? So where, where does that stand? That's where this um, gets pretty powerful. So then it's able to find that delineator. Let's see what our, our AUC is again, uh, 1.0. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Not that I expect anybody to like start going out and you know being able to do this instantly, but really to show you that it's easy to start to get hands on with this with Scikit-Learn and Python. And, and you know Scikit-Learn is kind of the the first step into this realm. Um, what, what we use today is kind of well beyond that, but it, it really is accessible to anyone to start to take your data, and whether it's you know the static behavioral data from Android or um, whether it's logs, right? So I think you know, there's huge opportunity using machine learning uh, in you know, network traffic, PCAPs, et cetera, in detecting uh, malware. I think there's a huge opportunity in looking at you know, kind of insiders, um, exfiltrating data, uh, where you kind of train on that and where you kind of monitor you know, the, the network traffic going out, the websites visited, et cetera, and then being able to find those outliers. So I, I think that the machine learning with uh, binary classification in malware detection is just kind of a first step into this um, really, I think, uh, challenging and um, uh, important, I think, as we look forward in uh, how we scale to protect these devices. So back to um, our presentation here and, and back to what we're doing with that probability, right? So we take, you know, I talked about it's a, it's a probability, 0 to 1.0. Um, but we take that on a 0 to 10 scale. So we've just taken the 1.0 and kind of, you know, to, to the 0 to 10. And, you know, our hypothesis at the beginning was these malicious apps that we're able to detect in Google Play and the Apple App Store are ending up on employee devices. So, you know, from the beginning, you know, what we found was this trend on the bottom of these top apps, right? So this bar chart shows, you know, zero, there's 23% ones, and then, you know, two to two to three percent nines or tens. So this was the trend that we were starting to see. But what we found um, with our partnerships with our uh, mobile device management solutions are these apps are actually finding their way on employee devices and really follow that same trend. So we found the average enterprise um, has 2,400 unsafe applications. So about 3% when you take into account the median and the mean. So 3% of apps that are eight or above. You know, some of these are known malware that already have signatures uh, assigned to them. Some of them are detected by the ML uh, with no signatures. So it, th this you know, is fulfilling to us because our hypothesis is starting to be proven. Um, and and you know, because we're in Vegas, we took a look at uh, gambling apps in particular. And gambling apps today, uh, well, well, what we found is there's 35 different gambling apps in the average enterprise. So gambling, it's an interesting genre. Um, I, in being in defense and intelligence, I had to do the security th clearance thing. And uh, well, my data is now, it, people have it because of the recent hack. Uh, but that's really great. But uh, my point here is with the gambling apps, uh, it's uh, it, enterprises that are, you know, a little bit more secure, 
they, they're concerned that their employees are using these gambling apps. And again, back to you know, security clearance, you know, it would certainly be flagged as an issue uh, because there would be kind of a propensity for uh, bribery you know, if you're using you know, real currency uh, gambling. So that's what's kind of interesting to these enterprises is kind of taking a look at that, government agencies, et cetera. Uh, so we looked at 17 or so of these uh, gambling apps. We found you know, four created by Playtica, two by Zynga, uh, two by Phantom EFX. Um, so Google doesn't allow real currency gambling apps. Uh, Apple does uh, with the proper licensing and everything in place. Uh, in Europe, I think it, it, there's already real currency gambling apps in those stores. Uh, but you, this is going to explode. Like this, again, and we look back at cryptography, we look back at those vulnerabilities. This is concerning when people start to really, um, you know, have real currency associated with these applications. Uh, this is a $100 billion industry by 2017. No surprise, right? Look around here. Uh, look, at, look at what, you know, gambling, uh, the, the revenue that it can provide. So um, again, you know, these apps are not just running on the devices. They're sending data to and from uh, locations around the world. Uh, looking at these 17 gambling applications, we found you know, a large number of them use Adex tracking as a library. Uh, so you know, all these free apps, this is the way they're monetizing. They're collecting your contact location information, uh, you know, messages, et cetera, and, and using that to monetize. Uh, but Adex tracking in particular is uh, sending that to 300 data brokers and advertising networks, uh, so that's an issue. Uh, Google, Facebook, of course, collecting massive amounts of data in these applications and ad exchange. Uh, we found with about nine of these apps, uh, they're recording audio, which is bad, right? They have the capability of recording audio. Uh, Hit it rich casino slots accesses your contact information. GSN casino accesses your social networks. Um, Texas Poker also accesses your social network information. Uh, but what we found is you know, a lot of these apps have hard-coded keys, uh, values, authentication, um, et cetera. Oh, this is really bad. You can't see this at all, sorry. But uh, there's just some code snippets here of uh, the bolded area is the hard-coded key. Um, the, this bottom uh, block of code is showing how it's checking if the device is rooted. So seeing a lot of that. Um, on the other side, it's kind of our app reputation piece. So again, you know, I think this app is accessing uh, audio uh, information, doing a lot of advertising, uh, et cetera. This is a Slotomania app. Again, on the right, you can see the hard-coded key. Uh, this app is sending data, I think, to Ireland and Israel. Uh, you can see that the, the data traffic sent there, so bytes sent uh, halfway down on the right. This is 24 megs. Like what, what, actually that's bytes received, I'm sorry. 24 megs. So this app goes out and downloads something that's that big from that uh, server. And then um, you see policy violating code. Uh, the upper left you can't see at all, but it's uh, actually in the clear. So this app was sending uh, most of the data in the clear except with the exception of the Google uh, data. Uh, gender, birthday, and my last login, time and date. Oops. Go back. Um, a couple Android examples, uh, just to be safe, like that, those were iOS gambling apps. These are now Android apps. Uh, this is a Wi-Fi booster app. Um, I don't think it's doing anything but boosting your data, right? I don't know, these people download these apps. Well, how do they think that they're boosting the Wi-Fi? I have no idea. But this app is doing that, and you know, 800,000 people or so have downloaded this app. Um, this is sending data all around the world. Uh, it's re retrieving your SIM card information, getting your UD ID information, IMEI, et cetera, monitoring your device location. Uh, you're retrieving carrier information and listening for key presses. Uh, this is a battery saver app. Again, why 100 million plus people think that this app uh, is going to save their battery, I have no idea. Uh, and actually, you see the spiky CPU in the corner, it's draining your battery, right? It's not really saving your battery. Um, again, sending uh, data to China here. Uh, this battery saver app reads your contacts, gets the device identification information, SIM card information, uh, location, 
carrier, Android account, and also listens for key presses. It's funny, uh, I show these apps, you know, on occasion in presentations, and I find people in the audience like looking at their device and they're like, I'm gonna, I have to delete that. I'm glad I'm not seeing it here. Yeah, so we have a directory that's available. We go out every night and get the top 200 apps from each of the, the top categories. Um, so you would be able to either set up a policy uh, that says, you know, I don't want any apps that are getting my contact information, and then we could um, alert you to those. So policy, is it's all about policy, right? So we gotta scale to protect this. Uh, we can't just do the one-offs. Uh, so again, these are very much aligned with what we've learned in the wired world. So protecting sensitive data in use in transit and at rest. So we have 180 different policy attributes um, that you can assign to prohibit these types of applications. Uh, you know, so at the top are those uh, different um, categories. And then the bottom are categories of like what's sensitive to you, right? Is it location information? Is it your messages, your call logs, your browser history? Um, do you want to prohibit apps that root the device, et cetera? And then, you know, I mentioned our directory. This is, uh, you know, on the right, again, hard to see, but those uh, top apps, and then you could see the policy violations there. So the, here are the top blacklisted apps that we find in the enterprise from both an iOS and the Android perspective. So probably no surprise, Dropbox, um, Facebook, you know, some Angry Birds, Netflix, et cetera, certainly, you know, for productivity. And, and you know, that's the challenge here, is uh, finding that balance between enabling productivity that mobile provides, right? That's why everybody's adopting mobile. Uh, so enabling productivity, but managing the risk, both the personal risk, which was really our agenda for doing this from the beginning, is like seeing all these apps, seeing you know, that these devices are essentially tracking devices, and seeing that these apps are just getting massive amounts of uh, user data. It's just um, it's so concerning to me, and that people don't really care. They're not really treating their data as valuable as it should be treated. And, and then when we talk about creating these policies, uh, we don't want um, to take the burden on to create those ourselves, nor do we want you as uh, security experts to take on that burden you know, alone. Um, that would be a very bad idea to start to create these policies and push those out to your organizations. Uh, so we see it as a collaborative effort between the business unit who's wanting these applications for their employees to be more product productive. Um, and then also you have to bring in HR and legal uh, to some extent because uh, there could be something in the terms of particular um, applications that are concerning. Uh, I think we talked about the process. Really, you know, what happens with those policies is they become automated app blacklists. And again, to uh, approach this challenge at scale, uh, you need that. You need uh, an automated way to create these blacklists uh, because, again, as security professionals, we don't want to be the ones that are looking at these uh, millions of apps. And I think by, what was it? I think at 2017, um, there will be 400 billion app downloads. So it's insane to start to wrap your head around how can we uh, protect ourselves against these malicious applications. And, and I think lastly here, uh, nobody likes to see an infinity symbol when you know, you're talking about work, but it really is kind of a process. And again, we're trying to really make this scientific and using the data uh, from the machine learning using you know, our background in statistics, computer science, to, to not be like, oh my God, like this is a huge risk, this is you know, FUD, oh, oh no, really being like, here is your calculated risk here. Here is you know, probability times impact. You know, the impact being you know, what we see these apps are doing, and the prob probability being how these apps are uh, ending up on your devices. So it, it's a continuous process of policy, automated app blacklist, enforcing that on the device, and then assessing that, um, you know, from a numerical basis, not just uh, a binary, you know, are you at risk or aren't you? So that's what I had for you today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Probably this, it's a little bit loud in here. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>